great idea to invite Christine Watkins to the parish mission uh, along with the book that she just published. And it is about the warning, the illumination of conscience. There is a long history of prophecy in the Catholic Church. So we to see tonight. I think uh, nobody will fall asleep uh, tonight in, in this talk. So, Christine, again, welcome back to our Daily Assumption. Good evening. This is like a second home to me, and I think most of you know me from other talks, and my claim to fame is having done everything wrong. So the first half of my life, I was boldly charging in the wrong direction. And so I'm standing before you as a divine mercy icon, as it were, because I was supposed to have died from my sins. I was an anti-Christian, anti-Catholic atheist. And I'm alive only because of a miracle of divine mercy. And so I was one of those people who would annoy people like you. I was the one thinking bad thoughts in my head, thinking, what a loser. Look, they're following a fairy tale. How sad that they go to church, the little baby Jesus, and they feel like, oh, maybe, you know, they, they went through a breakup with a boyfriend or something bad happened, and they were grasping at straws, so they had to believe in a fairy tale. So I was a lot like the people in this joke. There were two priests, and they were outside their parish, and they were holding up signs saying, the end is near, turn yourself around before it's too late. And a car drove by and said, idiots! And then you hear this screeching of tires and a big splish in the water. And more cars would go by and they'd hold up their signs. The end is near, turn yourself around before it's too late. And other cars would speed by and one car went by and they leaned out the window, you religious nuts, put your signs down. And you hear, and then sploosh. And one of the priests turns to the other and says, do you think we should change our sign to say the bridge is out? <laughs> <laughs> So here I was, I wasn't exactly shouting bad things at Catholic Christians, but like I said, I, I thought that following a fairy tale was a very sad, sad thing. But now I know my life is God's life, and it was God's life all along. So I do try to follow His will every day. And after I was healed and saved from a terminal illness, I decided that I was going to help people in life and death situations. And I worked in hospice for 10 years with the dying and the grieving. And then God moved me from that into post-abortion healing, where I was again working with life and death issues and grieving. And meanwhile, God was having me give talks around the country, tell my sordid story, and how God saved me, and also I went to theology school, I learned about the faith, and he has having me write books. He had me write one book, and another book, and another book. And about eight years ago, he let me know he wanted a book about what Father Manuel mentioned. It's called The Warning, The Illumination of Conscience. And I found out about it, and I thought, is this really true? And I'll tell you what it is, but it's a monumental, worldwide scale moment in which every person on earth will see their soul the way God sees it in light of their sin. And I said, God, that is so huge. I, I don't want to be wrong, and I'm not willing to do all the work. It takes me years to write a book because I want it to be good. And I said, if you're going to have me write about this phenomenal event to happen to every person on earth at the same time in a few short minutes, then I think that it would need to have included in it people who've already been through this illumination of conscience suddenly and against their will. So I said, if you bring me those people, I'll write the book. And I kid you not, within eight weeks, I had met 
five people who actually experienced a sudden illumination of their own soul. They had, some of them didn't even believe in God when it happened. And I learned of five more it happened to, and they all ended up in the book, and they all ended up sharing with me their, the intimate details of what happened to them. So I took that as a yes, because after those eight weeks, I'd never, I've never met anyone since to whom that happened. So I started to write, and it's called The Warning, Testimonies and Prophecies of the Illumination of Conscience. And it came out recently, and it's very, very, very important that we pay attention to this, and I'm going to tell you why. Some of you and some of the people who are going to learn about this in the next while are going to want to grab everything they can and find out more about it and give it to everyone they know because they'll feel a sudden impulsive importance to it. And some people will be very leery and say, I don't even know if I believe that. But to those who say, that sounds wacko, I, don't, I can't wrap my mind around that, that's never happened before in history, God wouldn't do anything new like that, I will say that the list of spiritual heavyweights to whom God has mentioned this event is impressive. And so the prophecies of the warning that I researched and collected for the book are by no means exhausted. And they come from many church-approved sources and many credible people. St. Edmund Campion in the 1500s, Blessed Anna Maria Taiji, Blessed Pope Pius IX, St. Faustina Kowalska, the bishop-approved apparitions at He, Germany, mystic Elizabeth Kindleman of the Flame of Love Movement of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, approved by bishops, the Marian apparitions at Garabandal, Spain, St. Pope Paul VI, Father Stefano Gobi of the Marian Movement of Priests, Matthew Kelly, founder of the Dynamic Catholic Institute, mystic and stigmatist Janie Garza, servant of God Maria Esperanza of the Church Approved Apparitions in Batania, Venezuela, mystic and stigmatist Luz de Maria Bonilla, mystic exorcist and founder of a new order in the church, Father Michelle Rodrigue. In other words, I'm not making this up. This doesn't come from Christine Watkins at all. If there is no such thing as a coming warning or collective illumination of conscience, then every one of the people that I listed is dead wrong. And not only that, isn't it uncanny that all of these people living in different centuries, in different countries around the world, of different ages, some of them even children, have been told by God about the same exact event. And is it an uncanny that some people on earth, it already happened to? So we have witnesses of what it is like as well. So for people who think, well, I don't, I don't believe in all that prophecy stuff. How do you know prophecy is real? I just go by the Bible. I just go by the teachings of the church. Well, if you go by the Bible, the Bible has about 2,500 prophecies in it, 2,000 of which have already materialized with stunning accuracy, and 500 of which extend into the future. You have 20 books of the Bible called the prophetic books. You have the 12 minor prophets, and you have the six major prophets. They're prophets. They prophesy. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Baruch, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And so when it comes to the Messiah, this is how God has worked through human history. 700 years before Jesus was born, Micah, the minor prophet, said that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. 500 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Zechariah said that he would be betrayed for the price of a slave, which in, which in Jewish law was 30 pieces of silver, and that this money would be used to pay for a burial ground for Jerusalem's poor. Very obscure, very specific, totally accurate. 
500 years before. Even before crucifixion was invented, you have King David prophesying and, Ze and the prophet Zechariah prophesying about how our Savior would die. They didn't know what crucifixion was. They would talk about him being pierced, and it's a very unique death. So I am mentioning only three of the hundreds, 2,000, over that many prophecies in the Bible to make a point. How would these prophets of old be able to somehow know that God would become a man, that we'd kill God as a man? That's so obscure and outside of human reasoning or logic or, or even their understanding of who God was. So Pope Benedict XVI, when he was Cardinal Ratzinger, he let us know among many other popes and saints that Prophecy is a continual charism guiding the church. It didn't just end with biblical times and stop right there. The Holy Spirit didn't say, I'm not doing that anymore. That was just to end up in a book. No, that's how he works with his people. And Cardinal Ratzinger, who became Pope Benedict XVI, said, in every age, the church has received the charism of prophecy, which must be scrutinized but not scorned. So, it is being prophesied that a monumental event is on the horizon of the world's history. And even though many, and my list that I read off to you that's in the warning book is not exhaustive by any means, many, many people have prophesied of this earth-shaking event. So why is it not being preached in every church? Why is it not being shouted from one Christian rooftop to the next? Well, the reason why, what happens to the prophets in salvation history over and over again? Were they listened to by the masses? They never were. They never were. They were met with hardened rejection, dismissal, or indifference. And then there's a few there's a remnant. A few people believe, and they act, and they take it to heart. And God builds his church on those few, year after year, century after century. So this is really important that you're here. It's really important who you speak to about this. It's really important whether you absorb this information or not. And I'll tell you why. Because this is yet another matter of life and death that God has roped me into. Life and death of the soul, and even life and death of the body. The book shares in great detail what will happen in this illumination of conscience, but I'm going to share with you just an outline of it here that takes all the prophet's information and puts them in one outline. And much of it is also, by the way, mentioned in Matthew 24, verses 29 to 31, which I'll read later. So first of all, all light from the sun will be extinguished. The moon will not shine. The stars will not shine. It will be pitch black. And then suddenly, two celestial bodies will collide and produce a massive light, and Jesus will appear in the sky on the cross, not in his crucified form, but in his glorified state. And from holes in his wounds, in his hands and his feet and his side, rays of light will suddenly light up the earth. Day will be brighter than day. Night will be brighter than day, wherever you are on the earth. And at the same moment that the earth is lit up, everyone's soul will be pierced in the divine light of truth. Every person will be alone with his or her conscience in that moment. And everything will stop. If you're in a car, it will stop. If you're in a plane, it will stop. And people can say, well, how can God do that? He's God. He created the matter. He can do with it what he will. Jesus walked. He appeared in the upper room out of nothing. He ascended into heaven. Do you think that the plane won't be able to stop him? Did I say that right? Do you think that he won't be able to stop the plane? 
Everything will be fixed in time. And for about five to 15 minutes, people will see all of their sins, their sins of omission, the things they didn't do but were called to do, and their sins of commission, the things that they did and weren't supposed to have done. And they will see the repercussions of those sins. And they will feel what it's like should they die at that moment. And they will know where they're supposed to go, whether it be heaven, purgatory, or hell. So a person will recognize their faults immediately. For those who would go to purgatory, they will feel the pain of their sin, and they will know what they have to correct. For those very close to God, they will see those small things that they need to perfect in order to have union with their beloved. And for the ones who would go to hell, they will burn. They will feel the whipping of Satan, and they will experience his beatings, and many will not survive because of the emotional impact of this. But even so, if they were to have a stroke or a heart attack, even that will be part of God's mercy because they will still have time to repent. They will see and know their state, and there's still the possibility of salvation for them. So as you can see, the warning will be one of the greatest acts in the history of Christianity, one of the greatest acts that God will have done since the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's a huge act of mercy for a world going in the wrong direction. Why is God sending it? It's because it's a correction of the conscience of the world. Our conscience has gone dark. People are not being taught what is right and what is wrong anymore. In fact, they're being taught the opposite. We're living in times very much like Noah lived in before the flood. No one will be able to say there is no God after the warning. No one will be able to say, I didn't know that was a sin. How could I have known? They will know. We're so far off the railroad tracks of righteousness that some people don't even know where the tracks are. They wouldn't even know where to look to get back on. Too many of God's children are falling into perdition and his heart is breaking and he cannot take it anymore. He wants to act. This is the day of mercy that he mentions to St. Faustina Kowalska in her diary. Jesus urges people to use this time right now, right now, to accept his mercy, to repent and change. He said, he who refuses to pass through the door of my mercy must pass through the door of my justice. Tell souls about this great mercy of mine, because the awful day, the day of my justice, is near. To read to you the scripture passage, Matthew 24, verses 29 to 31, it says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming upon the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a trumpet blast, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. A lot of people, understandably, don't know what that passage is about. Another question you might have is, well, what exactly will happen to people during the warning who are in very serious sin? And your ears, I'm sure, perked up as mine did when I read from these prophecies that many people will not survive it. The only consoling notion for me regarding that news is that their death will be a grace for them. The mystic and stigmatist Janie Garza, who has the full approval of her bishop to share her messages, was told by St. Joseph in 1994, 
For those who believe they live in the light, but continue to break every commandment given by God, to these souls, I, St. Joseph, say that these souls will not be able to see the state of their souls and live. Janie Garza responded to him like most of us would, saying, this is hard for me to know. Are you saying that people who do not live in God's commandments will die when they see their souls? St. Joseph answered, yes, my little one, that's how it will be for many unless they repent and decide for conversion. There is still time for repentance, but time is growing shorter with each day that goes by. But those who are in a state of grace have nothing to fear. Jesus also said in one of his church-approved apparitions in Heed, Germany, I will make my light shine, a light which for some will be a blessing and for others, darkness. Mankind will recognize my love and my power, but do not fear. I am with you. You will rejoice and thank me. Those who await me will have my help, my grace, my love. So if you're really curious about what exactly happens to a soul during this illumination of conscience, I really invite you to read the stories in the book, because in reading them, you and I, we're gonna, we see ourselves. You can't help but see yourself in another person's full reflection, naked of their very soul. We can see what we do that's in line with God's love and what we do that skirts around it or shuns it entirely. And reading these stories is quite literally changing people's lives. I'm doing an audio book for one of them and a man reading the story, he said he couldn't go to work after reading one of the stories because it, it just changed him so much and he ran to confession and has become a different man. And the last story is everybody's favorite, at least my favorite. It's of a man named Marino Restrepo. I think it's probably the most amazing story I've ever heard of. This man is a modern day St. Paul figure. He was born in Colombia. He lived in Hollywood for a while where he became a great sinner, he says. He was into the New Age movement, sexual sins, thought he was hot stuff. He ends up going to Colombia on Christmas Eve night and he's abducted by Colombian rebel guerrillas and he's blindfolded, dragged into the Amazon jungle and tortured for six months. And a few days after his kidnapping for ransom, he, had, he was in a bat cave with excrement on him and bugs. It was in a living hell. And overnight, he had an illumination of his conscience. He saw his whole life starting from his first sin when he was young. He saw himself taking a stick at a very young age, about three, just bashing plants with it and the housekeeper telling him to stop. Up through into more and more devious and serious sins. He didn't know if he would live upon seeing the truth of it all. And then, he was also granted a signal grace that only two people on earth have. That same night after he had an illumination of his conscience, he was given a divine infusion of knowledge and he speaks around the world now. And he said, I could write a thousand books, I could give a thousand talks and I wouldn't even touch what God revealed to me overnight about himself. So his story is just, fantastic and it will change you it can't if you can't help but change you reading his going through that mystical experience so you also might be wondering is this going to happen in my lifetime i certainly wondered that so eight years ago when i got the sense that i should write the book when i got the calling i didn't feel a sense of pressure about it i thought well who knows when that's going to happen Okay, God, I get the sense from you answering my prayer that it is real, but I, I don't sense any urgency. Like it says in Second Peter, with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. And then as I was doing the research, the voices, the messages, the prophecies became more urgent and more urgent and more strident and saying it's closer, it's closer, it's coming, until... 
I read a message that Our Lady said to the mystic and prophet Lusta Maria de Bonilla. She's bishop approved, and her writings have seen have received an imprimatur, and she suffers from the stignata. And she just spoke somewhere, she's originally from Costa Rica, and wherever she goes, if she's near a crucifix, it begins to bleed or exude oil. There's all these manifestations of God saying, listen to what this woman is saying, because it's not her words, it's mine. And Our Lady said to her, on March 3rd, 2013, not that long ago, how close this generation is to the warning. And how many of you do not even know what the warning is? In these times, my faithful instruments and my prophet, meaning Lusta Maria, are mocked by those who consider themselves scholars of spirituality, by those who reach millions of souls through means of mass communication. They are misleading them and hiding the truth. Those who have not believed will be put to shame. And then, boom, on July 15th, 2019, right before the book was published, I snuck in this last message. St. Michael the Archangel declared to her, this is the generation that will experience the great act of divine mercy, the warning. And Lusta Maria is not the only prophet who's being told this. God the Father recently spoke to the exorcist, mystic, and religious superior of a new order, Father Michel Rodrigue. I was blessed to speak at a conference with him a couple weeks ago in California. And he's been giving talks in the U.S. and Canada. And God told him that the illumination of conscience will occur in, in our generation. And he's speaking to people who aren't very young, saying that they will experience it, helping them to prepare. As to what happens after the warning, there's about six, six and a half weeks when Satan will be kept at bay. Another act of divine mercy where God says, make a choice. I've shown you who I am. And people will know that the Catholic Church is the church that Jesus founded, that the Catholic Church contains the fullness of truth. And they will be confused. Many people who didn't even know there were, was a God will be wondering what just hit them. And you and I will be ready to bring them to church, to catechize them. We have to know our catechism. We have to know our scripture. We have to know our faith. If you don't know it yet, learn, start, know it. It's going to be very, very important. And God the Father showed Father Michelle Rodrigue masses of people coming in, lines for confession out the street, priests wondering what hit them. He's from Quebec, so he has a French accent. He's like, give them a sandwich. Please give them a sandwich and let them go to the bathroom. They're going to be mobbed. So Father Michel's going to need a sandwich, so pack that for him. Let him go to the bathroom. People are going to want to know what hit them and what they need to do, and you will know exactly what's needed. There'll be mass baptisms, there'll be confessions. And after six, six and a half weeks, the devil will come back to do his normal temptations. The media will say, we don't know what that was. That was a collective solar flare. We're not sure. People will go back into their old ways, and many, many will deny that it had anything to do with God because it was painful because they don't want to think it was real. It's easier to listen to the media, to listen to the lies. When that happens, after someone is shown truth, is shown God, is shown their soul, and says no, they become very dark. And after you and I have been shown truth, have been shown God's love, and repented, what will happen to us? We're going to be holy. <laughs> I'm looking forward to finally being holy. <laughs> <laughs> the good news for you and I is that w we get another chance. We're going to wake up out of this like Ebenezer Scrooge after the, the Chris in the Christmas carol. Like, wow, I get another chance. I really blew that. Yay! will know. And here's the thing. 
what are we going to do? It's easier. I think this is why God had me write the book, and I didn't do it for money, like some people on YouTube are saying, she wrote the book for money. I'm like, really? If I wanted money, I'd be a banker. I'd work at Starbucks. I'd make more money. <laughs> All the money goes back into evangelization for Queen of Peace Media, which I started. The idea is God, I believe, wants this book to go around. I mean, it's, I've never seen anything like it. It's going into Ireland. It's going into England. It's going into wherever people speak English. It's, it's exploding. I think people are wondering, what's happening with the church? What's happening with the world? Things are a little nuttier, nuttier than I've ever seen. I need answers. And this book is providing a lot, a lot of answers. And I have to give it to people who are going to look at me like I have green antennas growing out of my head and they're waving in the wind. You know that look. Like, uh-huh, Christine. Oh, you mean there's going to be a bright light and the rays are going to come down and everyone's going to see their souls and they're going to know that your church is right. How do we convey that? Well, the book really helps because if you get it, you read it, Decide who to hand it to this Christmas, because guess what? Even if they only look at it, even if they look at you like you have the green antenna blowing in the wind, when it happens, and if these prophets are correct, which I've met them and I believe that they're telling the truth, they're going to make it. They're going to remember, and they're not going to be deceived because they will have been told beforehand, this is of God, this is what you're experiencing, and this is what you're going to be called to do. And that's when they're going to thank you. And that's where they're going to run to you with tears in their eyes and just melt into your arms. It's going to move from confusion and you're a wacko to God bless you. So it's so important, right? There's many people I know, I don't, I don't know if they're going to make it. I really don't know. And my telling them about it, and the book's a much easier way to do it, because it's, it's step by step by step. It's not like telling them this crazy thing that they can easily relegate to the nut house. Another thing to do to prepare is a general confession. A general confession means you start from way back. The first thing you can remember and you go forward, and you don't take 12 hours with poor, dear Father Manuel. You just list your sins. You don't have to take forever doing it. God understands exactly what happened, but anything you can remember. And the book will help you with this, because as you read these different people's stories, you, like I, will think, that's a sin? That's a sin? Oh my gosh, there's a really holy nun. She was my spiritual director at the time, and, I, and she was so lovely. And I said, you know, this is crazy, but I think I'm supposed to write a book on this illumination of conscience. And she looks at me and she goes, I went through that. And so hers was this minor refining of her soul, right? She was already a beautiful person. So well, you're going to learn a lot, and you're going to know how to do a deeper confession. I was shocked to find out that, how many of you know who Matthew Kelly is? He's a, okay. God, the Father, told Matthew Kelly about this when he was about 19 years old. And Matthew Kelly's account, I think, is one of the most thorough and helpful accounts of the whole warning. I will read the last part of it. All of you, be like the blind man. Each day you should cry, Lord, open my eyes, and my son will open your eyes so that you can see your wretchedness and repent. Many people think that I, your God, won't mind. It's only a little, they say, but it's not a matter of minding. I want people to love me. Love respects little things as well as big things. And in most cases, these little things are not so little. Do not judge your actions or others' actions. You are unable to judge. You are incapable of judging because you cannot read a man's heart. You must love me with your whole heart, with your whole mind, with your whole soul, and with your whole strength. Today is the day 
Do your best to renounce yourself and let Christ reign in your lives. You will never be ready for the mini judgment, but some will be more prepared than others. You must aim to be one of those and bring as many others as you can to be prepared or as prepared as possible. So that is God the Father himself through Matthew Kelly telling us that we must aim to be one of those who helps others to be prepared or prepared as possible. Another thing that three of the mystics say is important, Father Stefano Gobi, Our Lady, told him that everyone should consecrate themselves to the Immaculate Heart of Mary for her protection and her guidance. And St. Joseph also told this to the stigmatist Janie Garza. So of the many things I have at the back table there from Queen of Peace Media, this is an ancient consecration that began in Mexico, and it's called Mary's Mantle Consecration, a spiritual retreat for heaven's help. It's 46-day consecration where you go through a virtue every day, two-minute meditation, and parishes are doing it around the country. Everyone says it's very well received. I haven't received a single complaint. In fact, when it ends, people want it to continue. They find that it's so spiritually nourishing because you're not only praying a daily rosary, you have a fasting day. You go to the reconciliation and you consecrate yourself to Mary but you are trying to incorporate a virtue or a gift of the Holy Spirit into your own soul every day. And no one gets into heaven without being perfected in the virtues. So if you want to be ready for your own death, because getting ready for the warning is the same thing as getting ready to meet Jesus face to face when we die. We all experience our personal judgment, which is very similar. There's no getting around it. So if you think, oh, I don't believe this warning stuff, well, know that every single person that has ever lived on this earth has come face to face with Jesus, the merciful judge, where all truth is revealed and there's no excuses. So make that a great day. Do something like the consecration. Read spiritual books. There's lots of spiritual books and talks and CDs and various things on the back table. Many things that have evangelized people and brought them back to the Catholic faith. I'll say the books are page turners. They're Amazon number one bestsellers and they are bringing people closer to God. That's, the, that's what I hear all the time. We've got to prepare people. Whatever attracts them, pray. Get something and think, who would need this? Don't just have stuff sitting on your shelf. Now is the time of mercy. Evangelize, evangelize, evangelize. Don't think of yourself and what people will think of you. Could I get up here if I worried about what y'all thought of me? I know some of you think I am crazy. But if I let that stop me, I wouldn't have written the book. I wouldn't be able to help anyone. You have a right to think I'm crazy. But I have a right to do what God is asking me to do, right? You have a right to tell people what's in your heart if God prompts you to. No one can stop you but yourself. And God bless you.